Welcome back to another Reaper Blog video. Today we're talking about Ginger Audio's Ground Control Sphere software, which is a software-based monitor controlling app. I don't have the surround setup to actually give this a good try. So I sent over the software to Matt Glenn, who I've worked with a couple times before. He works at Ears Up Sound Design, and they specialize in immersive audio. As I mentioned, this is a sponsored video. We got the software for free. I've also negotiated a fee for making the video to share this product with our audience. And I don't do sponsored videos very often. Doing a sponsored video in this case because I'm using some of their other software and have been for years. This is the Ground Control Caster software. And this has been such an important part of my recording and live streaming setup. I'm using this all day, every day. You can have multiple apps tying in here mixing down to a stereo channel, which you send over to the streaming software. You can add effects to any of these inputs. You can record anything. There's MIDI control. There is a soundboard, fantastic stuff, all the features you could want. And because I use this and I paid full price for it, um, and I, I have a relationship with Ginger Audio uh, for years now, uh, I did a video on previous software. I helped with beta testing some of the previous stuff. So when this opportunity came up, I suggested that we do it as a sponsor video and they agreed. So yeah, we did get paid for this video, but sometimes you have to. You can't just do every video for free. Hopefully it is packed full of useful information for you. Let's get into the video. Hey everybody, this is Matt Glenn from Ears Up Sound Design, and today I'm going to be reviewing Ground Control Sphere from Ginger Audio. Sphere is a software-based studio monitor control system that allows you to route, process, and generally control multiple input signals to your studio monitoring setup. Sphere offers speaker layout presets from basic mono and stereo all the way up to 16-channel 9.1.6 Dolby Atmos. So chances are, however you have your studio monitors set up, there's probably a preset within Sphere that will match. Sphere lists for $499, but right now, if you go to Ginger Audio's website, it is on sale, 20% off for $399. So I'm going to start by giving you a quick tour through the control interface, and then we'll dive into each section in a little bit more detail. Sphere's UI is anchored by this main overview where you can see most of the primary metering and controls. Up top, you have a top-down view of the control room with your configuration as selected. In my studio, I have a quad set up with two in the front and two surrounds, but of course you can select any size that you want. So you can go all the way up to the Dolby Atmos 9.1.6 and it will reflect here. In addition to seeing your layout, you have the ability to click on any speaker to solo it. To the left, you have your primary level meter, which shows peak and RMS and represents all of the inputs to your control room. To the right is a full loudness meter section, which is a very cool feature to include in a piece of software like this. We'll dive into the details of the loudness meters in a little bit. In the bottom center, we have some controls that will be familiar to anyone who has used a hardware monitor controller before. You have your main level knob, which controls the overall output to your control room from all inputs. Above that, you have the ability to flip left and right in your stereo image. You can invert polarity on either channel. You can sum your mix to mono to check mono compatibility. And in addition, you have the sides button what this does is introduce mid-side processing to your mix and solos the sides. This will cancel out any information that is identical in both the left and the right channel, such as the kick and the snare in this case, plus the bass, and highlight anything that's different. So in this case, the reverb and the overheads on the drums. Above that, we have some more options for soloing speakers. Clicking front will solo your front screen speakers and wide your widescreen speakers, in case you have those. You can solo your surrounds, your rears, and your top speakers for Adobe Atmos setup. On the bottom right, we find more familiar controls that you typically see in a monitor controller. We have a talkback mic, which can be set to be momentary, 
or latched on and off. You have three buttons for reference levels that allow you to quickly recall preset levels of your choosing. This is great for working with multiple calibrated levels for audio post-production folks. So let's say I wanted to change this reference level number one from this negative 19 random number to something new. I'm gonna right click on the button and I can either set the current new value like this, or I can manually type in, say, negative six. And now when I click it, it recalls the new level. To the right, you have a cut button, which allows you to mute the output, as well as a dim button, which will dim the output level by an amount that you dial in on the knob to the left. In the top right hand corner, you have a couple more controls and settings. This top button allows you to pin the window on top of your view. Now, for those of us who use multiple pieces of software with many windows open, it can be very easy to lose something like Sphere or like your audio interface controller, which you don't need very often, but when you need it, you really want to grab it quickly. So having this, really nice. You have the ability to do a light mode or a dark mode, or you can have the color scheme follow your system based on whether it's day or night. Now here you have the ability to scale your window up or down by fixed amounts or manually in the bottom corner. Below that, you have access to a hotkey menu. You can assign a hotkey to pretty much anything in the software, and there's a lot of options. So let's say I wanted to assign a hotkey to turn on and off input B, which is Reaper. I'm going to click this plus button and hit the number two because it's the second input. And now when I click two, it not only turns on and off the Reaper input when I'm in Sphere, but if I click into the finder, it still works. I will say that mapping keys to a piece of software that will still work when the software is hidden is inherently a little dangerous, especially if you happen to have a bunch of keys already mapped in Reaper and you may accidentally hit something and not realize that you did something in Sphere. So your mileage may vary, but proceed with caution. Down below the hotkeys is the MIDI controller setup menu. You can assign any MIDI controller that's either USB or over Bluetooth. And as soon as you're ready to map the controls, uh, you pick one control, right click it, and then you will move the controller on your MIDI surface. In this case, it's one of the knobs on my MIDI fighter twister to be the main volume knob. And it's as simple as that. Now as a side note, I would love to have a purpose-built MIDI controller for this type of software. Big knob, couple input and output buttons, talkback section, dim, etc. I mean, Take my money. Anyway, down below that is the menu for creating ground controls bridged audio devices. Now, these are virtual devices you can create within Sphere of the channel count of your choosing for routing in between pieces of software. Uh, but we're going to cover this a little bit more when we get into the inputs and the outputs. On the left hand side, you can see inputs A through H, a total of eight sources. Each one of these sources can be any of the channel configurations that you see up at the control room. In my case, I have set up input A to be a 12 channel 7.1.4 source, utilizing Ground Control's Sphere 16 virtual audio interface. Input B is another virtual audio interface directly from Reaper. C is Pro Tools. D is Zoom. And E is Google Chrome. Each input features an on and off button, a dedicated input meter, and a button in the bottom right corner labeled SUM. Now when SUM is off on all inputs, Sphere only allows you to listen to one input at a time. So if I turn this one on, it will turn off all others. But if the SUM button is on, then that input can mix with any other input. So if I always want Reaper to be active, I can click some there and leave the others to be toggled. In my case, I'm going to leave them all on some. Now, in addition to giving you an overall loudness meter for the control room, Ginger Audio 
has given each input an individual loudness meter in a floating window. Personally, I think this is one of the nicest touches because I can tuck this window off on another screen or in the corner of my main screen so I can glance over, just take a look at my loudness and peak information for that input, and then forget about it. I don't need to have the entire sphere window up and visible just to monitor my loudness. Now, much like the loudness meter in the main view, this gives you range, integrated loudness, short-term loudness, true peak, maximum short-term and momentary, and the ability to select your platform that changes how the meters show up. The settings wheel in the top right corner of each input opens up the detailed input view. Here's where you can select the audio device that provides the source for the input. In my case, it's a virtual device called Reaper Output, but I can select any virtual or physical audio device available to my computer. There are three built-in virtual devices from ground control, Sphere 16, Sphere 32, and Sphere 64, as well as access to the same bridged audio devices dialog available off to the right-hand side here. So let's create a bridge device. I'll add it and then click this paintbrush to edit the name. We can just call it bridge one. I'll make it four inputs and outputs. Now this is nice because as you saw, Ground Control offers a 1632 and 64 channel uh, device by default. However, if you wanted to make something smaller so that you could make an aggregate device, this is a nice way to do that. So once I've applied that, I can close. And now if I go back to say input F, I can select bridge one here at the bottom in quad as the input source. I can name this input bridge one, and I can even select a nice new color, let's say a sky blue. And now when I return, we see we've got this named and colored here. Now going back into the menu, down below the input and naming, we have a volume setting with stepped input. We have the ability to send this input to a Q mix or a headphone mix, which we'll go over in a moment. And then we have the ability to add a plugin. Now this is huge. I'll cover the plugins in just a moment, but know that you can insert a plugin on the overall input or you can insert it on any individual channel. And then down below, we have a breakdown of the four channels that comprise this quad input. So right now I've got input one and two going to speakers left and right. I can solo one or both. I can mute them. I can adjust the channel volume independently. I can add up to 1000 milliseconds of delay to any one channel. This is very, very nice, especially for those of us who would need to time align our speaker systems. And then last but not least, we have the plugins. This is one of the most groundbreaking features offered in this software, in my opinion. You have the ability to add any audio units plugin of your choice to an individual channel of the input or to the input as a whole. So let's, uh, let's turn this up just for a second so we can be hearing this in context. Let's say I was getting a little bit of a boomy bass on my left speaker, a little bit more than the right. I could come in to my plugins menu. I could insert a fab filter EQ and I could take the left channel and pull down the bass. And this is affecting only the left channel because that's where I've inserted it. And to remove that, you simply right click and select remove. You can also add plugins to the overall input. Uh, and because this is a quad input, if you have the ability, let's say I want to insert a uh, exponential audio 
Stratus, which is a nice reverb, I can not only add that, I can set it up to be any layout that I want. In this case, it's quad, but I could make it just stereo if I wanted to. I could do stereo to quad. And it's showing up in red because it doesn't match the exact layout, but it will still actually pass audio. Obviously, this is a bit of an extreme example. I'm not sure why you would want to put reverb on your monitor output, but hey, get creative. So I'll get rid of that, but I think you can see that when you add up the really detailed volume and delay control per channel, plus the ability to put plugins in, again, per channel or overall, it gives you this suite of tools that you can use to do anything from time aligning and tuning a room to just sweetening your monitoring setup to your taste. The outputs menu is divided into two different tabs. You have your main output here, which offers you a main speaker output, two alternates, as well as a cue, which you may use for your headphones, you may use for a monitor in another room, that sort of thing. And then you have four additional utility outputs to use as you'd like. Much like the inputs, each output features a settings menu where you can select your output device, name and color the output, set the volume, add a plugin, and then control the routing and other parameters on a channel by channel basis. Now, the addition that you find in the output section is base management. In the case of this main output, I have it set up as a quad, which does not feature a subwoofer by default. But if I were to change the setting to 5.1, a uh, 5.1 system has a subwoofer, so it opens up the ability to activate base management. Now, a quick aside about the speaker configurations available in Sphere. Most of them tend to adhere to some sort of cinema standard. Dolby 5.1, Dolby 7.1, Atmos, a, an Oro preset. And that's all well and good because that's going to cover a lot of studios out there. But what happens if you have a studio like mine where there's a quad setup, but I choose to buy a subwoofer and I want to set up my monitoring system so that I have base management and can preview mixes with base management. As of right now, there's no way to do that with Sphere. Currently, the only workaround would be to use a 5.1 system and then just simply not use the center channel. And that's fine, but it's a workaround, and I feel like it would be a relatively simple tweak to offer the option of an added subwoofer in formats that don't ordinarily have it. But again, it's a bit of a nitpick since there is a way to work around. Now, with that aside, the base management system here is pretty awesome. You have the ability to independently set high pass frequency and slope, low pass frequency and slope, for each and every channel that you'd like to send to the base management. For the sub, you only have low pass filter, but you do have a subwoofer volume here to dial that in. And of course, the overall system on and off switch. Again, much like the delay and the plugins, this is a fantastic feature for those of us who want to tune and calibrate a room. Now, I know there's a lot of you out there that probably work in an unideal acoustic space, especially after the pandemic. Uh, a lot of us converted a bedroom or some room in our house to be our studio. I completely understand it. I'm standing in a converted bedroom right now. We'll treat it as much as we can, but you can't necessarily get around certain issues with frequency response level. There's a lot of compensation that you can do with EQ and delay timing and deliberate processing set up on the output of your DAW before it hits the speakers. But when you buy hardware units for that, it can get really expensive really quickly. So I have to give Ginger Audio kudos because they've created a tool that's a lot more accessible to a wide base of users, but it still gives you a really comprehensive set of tools for managing your listening environment. Now, jumping back to the main view, uh, much like the sum on the input side, there's a lock button here, which when clicked means that if I select another output, this output remains untouched. If that were off, it would 
select only one output at a time. Much like the inputs, you have the ability to monitor individual outputs loudness. You have individual peak meters, and you have a trim dedicated to that output that takes you from negative infinity all the way up to zero dB. Now, specifically on the Q-Mix, they offer you some of the same controls that you get for the main monitor section. You can sum to mono, you can listen to the side channel, you can invert polarity on either channel, uh, as well as the included trim. Now, the last area of I.O. to talk about is the talkback mic. Much like the inputs and the outputs, there is a settings menu that allows you to pick a physical or virtual input for your talkback mic, name it, set a volume, add plugins. This might be great if you wanted to put in a, a high-pass filter or a compressor for your talkback mic. So let's set up a temporary audio interface. I have an RME Fireface here, so I'll just select the first microphone mono input as my source. And you'll see it pops up here uh, as being assigned automatically to speaker left. Now, that's not necessarily ideal. And this is where I had to find a bit of a workaround because uh, Ginger Audio wants this routing window to be very one channel to one channel. So what I wound up doing is doubling the input so that there's two mic number nines. And you'll see here I assign one to the left and one to the right. Of course, you may be assigning it down the Q line or have a completely different routing. It totally depends on your needs. So let's talk a little bit about what I liked. The first thing on my list is the routing flexibility. Sphere gives you eight inputs and eight outputs and a lot of possibilities for how to route them to each other. And this is great for studio users. It's great for mixers, post-production folks. But it's also great for streamers, Twitch users, and anybody who wants to take inputs from multiple sources and send them out of virtual interface into something like OBS or even just Zoom or Google Meet. When you want to showcase your work, put on a performance, do a YouTube live stream, et cetera. Sphere lets you do a lot of that. And it's really quite impressive how flexible it can be. Now, I've obviously already gushed about it a lot, but a second major win has to be the plugins for me. And I'll kind of lump this in with the EQ and bass management and delay and volume control that you get. The processing as a whole is really flexible, and I've yet to encounter another piece of software that reaches this level of flexibility in terms of matrixing inputs to outputs, both physical and virtual. In terms of controlling the interface, I really like that you can assign MIDI CC values to any control that you want. It means that in the future, if you pick up a hardware control surface that has the right set of controls, you could have a fully physical interface to interact with Sphere and never even have to click any of the buttons. Now, it's a bit of a wish list item, but I would love to see Ginger Audio incorporate OSC as well as MIDI as a control option. Most software that can handle OSC can also send MIDI messages, things like Max MSP or Touch OSC, Lemur, etc. In situations where your studio is network based or you're communicating across a network, I have found OSC to be a little bit more stable and reliable than network based MIDI. As of now, Sphere does not feature native support for full down mixes. Now, for those who don't work in surround formats as often, a full down is simply a reduction from a full surround format like Atmos or 7.1 down to a smaller format like 5.1 or stereo so that you can check what a theater mix will sound like on a home system. It's a very useful feature for those who create work in spatial formats that will eventually be broadcast or widely distributed in smaller channel counts. Now this might come in the form of a dedicated fold down button or it could come in the form of a more flexible routing solution for inputs. For instance, if I wanted to fold down this 5.1 input into a stereo feed, I don't have a way to do that in Sphere. I can send the same input channel to multiple speakers, but I can't send multiple input channels to the same speaker, which is what I would need to do to bring this mix down to just the left and the right. Now, there's probably a third-party plugin that can do this, 
But I feel like with a product like Sphere that's clearly targeting large studios with huge monitoring setups, being able to fold down seems like a natural addition to the suite of tools that's already there. An alternative idea might be in reformatting the way this input section is laid out. Now, I would love if instead of this side-by-side column situation where you use a drop-down menu to assign an input to a speaker, if there was a matrix view, such as you might see with Reaper's channel mapper down mixer, this would allow me, in addition to sending one input to multiple outputs, I could also send multiple inputs to one output, which would allow me to accomplish the fold down mixing that I was describing before. Now, next on my wish list is the ability to create customized loudspeaker layouts. This may not be as important for a lot of the user base out there, but for those who work in alternate spatial formats, this is kind of a big missing feature. For instance, our studio at Ears Up is formatted with 12 speakers in a circle, divided into groups of three, with each group of three having its own subwoofer and dedicated bass management. And that's in addition to a network of speakers across the ceiling and some down below. I would love to have the option to create my own custom layout and be able to process it. I'd still be using the same routing tools, the same bass management, et cetera. It's just a different preset that's an option in the dropdown menu. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the documentation and support for Sphere on Ginger Audio's website. When you first navigate to gingeraudio.com and go to the Sphere page, you get a list of features, and then there's a manual. The manual is fairly comprehensive, but it lacks a few key features that I also didn't find on the website, most notably an FAQ and a troubleshooting section, which exists for Ginger Audio's other products, but don't seem to exist for Sphere. Or maybe they just don't exist yet. I know that Sphere is a fairly new product, but I feel like Ginger Audio needs to prioritize getting those parts of the documentation up and running. Now, my last thought is about stability. Now, I mentioned that I've been using Sphere for about three weeks now, and for the most part, it has been perfectly stable. Even when I load it down with plugins, it seemed to just hum right along. What I have found, though, is that if I let my computer go to sleep or sit idle for a long time, for whatever reason, it loses communication with the virtual devices that act as inputs and outputs. So I showed you earlier that I have a Reaper input and a Pro Tools input, a Zoom input. Those currently are running through a separate piece of software called Loopback uh, in order to collect the sound from those pieces of software and route them to Sphere. But I have also tried this with Sphere's own bridged audio devices. And in both cases, after a while, they just stop responding. And I have to quit Sphere and restart it, which is not the end of the world, but I do feel like that's a feature that the users would be using a lot. So my hope is that Ginger Audio will be able to patch some of these issues in the next update. With all that aside, I think Sphere is a really awesome piece of software, and Ginger Audio did a really good job packing it with features that are super useful for day-to-day workflow. I've been using it pretty consistently for the past three weeks, and I can say that it has sped things up whether I am designing, mixing, or just on a Zoom call. So the website is www.gingeraudio.com. The product is called Ground Control Sphere, or GCS. The price is listed at $499, but it's currently 20% off on sale for $399. You can use a fully featured copy of the software for 14 days as a free trial before you have to pay for it. And I think it's really worth trying out. As for me, you can find more about my and my company's work at earsupdesign.com or on Instagram at earsupdesign. So thank you for watching, and don't forget to support John and the Reaper blog. He's been doing amazing work for so many years. I know that he was one of the main resources that I used when I was first getting into Reaper. So thank you all for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you so much, Matt, for this great video outlining everything for Ground Control Sphere. Thank you to Ginger Audio for sponsoring this video. Thank you to you for watching this video. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Support the Reaper blog through Patreon. Visit reaper.blog for more tutorials.